We're going to be looking at three basic passages this morning, Matthew chapter 24, and then Joel chapter 3, and Zechariah chapters 12 and 14. Uh, so if you can find those three books, you can find your way to them as we get there in a little while. And uh, not everybody's read Joel lately, but I hope you will. And Zechariah as well. We've been looking at it quite a bit ourselves as we've studied Bible prophecy and what's coming up in the near future. And I say near with a capital N in my own personal opinion. I, I don't think it's far off at all. And I think that what's happening in the Middle East right now is an indicator of it. And I know some people are saying, well, it looks like they're starting a war over there. And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, Israel definitely has declared war on Hamas, officially declared war by the vote of their Knesset. And they have two branches, and they were all in total agreement. Yes, this is all out war time. We've got to do something to stop this. And so they are uh, declaring war against Hamas, which Hamas is a, a terrorist organization that is ruling the Gaza Strip where the Palestinians are. So you, you hear those names, and sometimes it's hard to get them straightened out. But the Palestinian people live there in the Gaza Strip. But they're governed by Hamas, which is um, a terrorist organization that's sponsored by Iran. If that doesn't confuse you, I hope you, that's why you need to write the notes down. Uh, and that's who's attacked yesterday. Thousands of rockets they fired, sent troops thin across the border, tore down some of the border fence, captured some of the Israeli people, some of the soldiers, some civilians. It's all out war. But then there's Hezbollah that's another terrorist group that's working in Lebanon, the country right north of Israel, and they have attacked this morning. Israel expected it to happen. Uh, they fired some rockets and Israel retaliated very quickly. All this is involved, I've mentioned, Iran, which is closely tied with Russia and China. We're in a historical point in our world right now. And some people say, well, was this the Battle of Armageddon? No, it's not. Very quickly, I need to let you know, the Bible predicts three major wars before the second coming of Christ. The first one is in Psalm 83. We're not going to study it this morning, but you can when you get home. The 83rd Psalm, it talks about a war where Israel's immediate neighbors will attack her. It names the nations or the tribes that are on the east side of Israel in, in, in the country of Jordan today and even down in the Negev in the desert in the southern part. And then it names the countries and the tribes that go up the Mediterranean Sea coast, including Palestine, Palestinians, okay, the Philistines in their day, Gaza, where it's happening right now, all the way up into Lebanon. Um, that war is predicted. Is this that war? It could be the beginning of it. I don't know. It could be. But then there's a second war that's predicted after that. And that is the Gog-Magog war that you find in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And that's involving Russia and Turkey and Iran coming against Israel. And the theologians in years past feel like that what was going to happen was that Psalm 83 war would take place and Israel will just about exhaust herself against their neighbors who will be attacking them from up close. And once they do that, then Russia is going to say, ah, now's our chance. They shot all their bullets. Now we can come and we can take the Israel that we've always wanted and we can eliminate every Jew off the planet, which is what we're wanting to do. And that is the Gog Magog War. And you'll have to read about that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So that would follow the Psalm 83 war. Now, how close after that? Is it 24 hours or two years? We don't know, but it's going to be quick. They would try to get Israel at their weakest. Those two wars are biblical. They're going to happen. And then finally, the Battle of Armageddon. Well, guess what we're going to talk about today? We're going to, get, we're going to just touch a little bit on Armageddon today. Okay? I wasn't planning on getting into that other this morning at all, but well, I didn't write the history yesterday. God did. So we're going to look at that because we know that the next thing on God's counter for us right now is the rapture of the church getting us out of the way. Uh, now is that going to be before or after that 83, uh, Psalm 83 war? I don't know. 
I don't have any idea. We'll find out as we go. But Jesus' disciples asked him, what would be the signs of your return? When are you going to come back? How are we going to recognize? When, we, when are you going to get back? You said you're coming back. Tell us. Tell us about that. And so in Matthew chapter 24, he gives them the answer. And it's lengthy, but we're just going to take a little piece of it here today. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 21, it's for then shall be great tribulation. Now this takes place right after the rapture of the church. God rescues the Christian people off the planet before the tribulation begins. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Get the picture of what the world is going to be like. The rapture of the church, the catching away of the bride of Christ, every Christian. When we're removed, Satan is going to be allowed to have full reign to do all the evil that he wants to do on this planet. He's going to try to destroy everybody who will not bow down and worship him. And of course, many of those will be destroyed as well. And that's the period called the tribulation period. It's a seven year period of time and he really comes to power halfway through it, three and a half years into it. And then three and a half years into it, God is going to unleash His fury and His wrath on this God-hating, Christ-rejecting world. Because you understand, that's all that's left. Christians are gone, except those who get saved after the rapture, and there will be some. That, and we, you say, well, how do you know that's true? Because it says, there should no flesh be saved except for the elect's sake. Well, the elect is always referring to Christian people. If you're saved here, listen to me, if you're a Christian here today, if you've been born again, you are one of the elect. Amen. You wouldn't be saved if God didn't choose to save you. That's right. You can't get saved by yourself against God's will. No, He chooses to save everybody who is saved, and that's why you see the term the elect. So there's going to be some elect. There's going to be some Christian people here. They're not going to live through the rapture and get, miss it. They're going to get saved after the rapture. All the Christians are going to be gone. But then there's going to be some people who are sitting in their church just like this. I said, well, I remember what the scripture said. Where'd they all go? They got raptured up. Oh my, I got to get saved. I got to get born again because I know what's going to happen next. I know the tribulation period is going to take place and Satan's going to come to power and the Antichrist is going to rule. Trust me, dear Jesus, I give myself to you. And there's going to be some people saved. They're the elect. And he said, if were it not for them, nobody would survive. Well, what's going to be going on? How bad is it going to get? Here again, you don't have time to read, but I'm going to suggest you write your notes down. For Revelation chapter 6 through 18, you'll find all the terrible things that are going to take place. You're going to find out about the burning up of all the vegetation. You're going to find out about the sea, all the life within the sea dying. You're going to find out about ships burning and sinking at sea. You're going to find out about the wars and the rumors of wars that are going to be taking place all over the planet. You're going to find out about the earthquakes and the volcanic eruptions. You're going to find out about all the terrible things that God is going to do because these people hate Him. His wrath will be poured out. It's going to take place. They won't have water to drink. And they're going to be attacked by supernatural beings called locusts. The Bible describes them with stingers. It's going to sting them. They're going to hurt so bad. People are going to pray to die, but they won't be able to die. They're just going to keep being in pain. <coughs> That's another sermon for another time, but you can read about it. It's going to happen. God said so. It will happen. But thank God for the elect. God looks down and He says, I see these people. They've trusted my son. They've been born again. These are my children. I, 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 I can't let Satan totally destroy them all. I'm going to bring it to an end. Now I'll go down to verse 29, if you would. Same chapter, Matthew 24. Verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, at the end of that seven-year period, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now if you've got a red-letter Bible, you know this is Jesus saying this. Is there any doubt? He's telling the truth. He knows exactly what's going to happen. It says in the 30th verse, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, that's Himself, in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven, with coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. He's going to gather all the Christian people together throughout all the ages. All of those that belong to him. He's going to gather them together. They, we've been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We've been raptured. We've been in heaven. But He's going to gather us together because He's coming back with us. So the tribulation period is going to end with the second coming of Christ and His angels and all those Christians who were caught up in the rapture. My question is, are you going to be one of them? Oh, I don't ask you if you hope you will. Are you going to be one of them? Do you know for a fact that when this happens, that includes you? Yes. Yes. If you don't know for sure, this is a good day to get right with God. That's right. You need to know because this is coming fast. Christ's return and the final battle of Armageddon that's going to take place when He returns is described in Joel chapter 3 and also Zechariah 14. So, I ask you to find Joel chapter 3. Let's turn to that together. Beginning in verse 1 of the third chapter of the book of Joel. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. And God says, there's going to be a day when I'm going to regather the people of Israel. He said, I'm going to bring them back to the land. Well, he's already done that, hasn't he? That's why there's a war going on over there. <laughs> They've been back in the land for quite some time now. God said it was going to happen. It didn't happen for a couple of thousand years, but he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring them back. He said, I'm going to bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, and I will gather all the nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I'll plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations and parted my land. As we get towards the end of the tribulation period, Antichrist is going to be leading a huge, massive army. And they're going to be coming against Israel because there's, there, there's going to be a bastion there of people who say, no, we'll not bow down to you. We worship the one true living God. Whether they're Jews or whether they're Christians, they're, they're kind of holed up there in the city of Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going to bring the, all the armies against you. And that's what, exactly what's going to happen. He wants to destroy everybody who will not bow down to Him. Remember, God is still in control. God's still on His throne. And He is drawing those armies into the valley of Jehoshaphat to judge them and pronounce sentence upon them. Why? Why would He? What is the difference? Look, this verse tells you. Look very carefully. There's some words in here that are key words. He said, I'm going to bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and plead with them there for... My people and my heritage, Israel, they scattered among the nations and parted my land. God says, wait a minute, I'm not through. These people belong to me. This land belongs to me. What have they done? They've scattered my people. He intentionally, originally had promised the land of Israel to the people of the nation of Israel. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And He gave them the land. He said, but they don't have it. They've never had it completely, all of it. They've divided the land and they've scattered my people. The Romans scattered the Jews in AD 70. And they were scattered for all those years until they came back into the land less than 100 years ago. They've been scattered. And he said, they're going to pay a price for scattering my people. And they parted my land. <coughs> Is the land parted? Well... Well, you have to read the description of where the land's boundaries were when God described it to Abraham and said this is what it's going to be like. And he, he reiterated to his son and his son. And he signed out that the, the boundaries go all the way from a river in Egypt, all across, all the way up, all the way up, all the way up to the Euphrates River in Iraq and Babylon. That's a huge amount of territory. And not once has Israel ever 
possessed the entire land. It has been divided for all these centuries. Right now, if you were to look at that on a map, what would you see? Well, you look to the south and you see Egypt. Egypt is occupying part of the land that God gave to Israel. Whose land is it? God's. He said, they've, got, they've divided my land. Egypt has got part of it, and he's not happy about that. Egypt's going to pay a price. And, of course, the big issue we've been hearing about on the news here in the last 24, 48 hours is about Gaza. The Gaza Strip, the Palestinians, they're on the western edge of Israel between the nation of Israel and the Mediterranean Sea. It's divided. They're not supposed to be there. They're supposed to belong to Israel. God said, I gave it to them. It's the promised land, all right? And then you move northward and you, and you look across the other countries that are there and who else is there? There's the Lebanese. They're in that land. The Syrians, they're in that land. The Jordanians, they're in that land. And they all want part of it. Israel is in that land. But Israel is in just a small portion of it today. But the day is coming, God's going to change that. Oh, He's going to change it. His land is divided. The reason the attack came yesterday is the Palestinians want it. They said, oh, we're just retaliating because they have been governing us and ruling over us in our land. They have taken our land from us. <laughs> no, they didn't. As a matter of fact, the Gaza Strip was given back to them like 18 years ago, I think it was, and let them have self-rule. But still doesn't solve the problem that's not their land. But they want it. Hamas wants it. Hezbollah wants it. Syria wants it. Jordan wants it. Iraq wants it. Iran wants it. They all want Israel. You say, why in the world do they want that little bitty country? I mean, it's just a speck on the map compared to the whole world. Interesting. It's God's land and His people. And they've divided it and they want His land. And they've been fighting over it for centuries. They're fighting over it today. You're still in Joel chapter 3. Move down to verse 11. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together round about thither, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. He said, you come on. You come on. Come on. You're wanting to come. You come on. God's going to say, I'm going to draw you in, and I'm going to judge you there. That's what Jehoshaphat means, the place of judgment. He said, I'm going to judge him. Skip down to verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord, this is a reference to the second coming of Christ, the day of the Lord when He returns. Listen to what it says. When they're gathering, He says, He's coming back soon. When you see Him start coming around towards Jerusalem and they're wanting to surround it, Watch out. Jesus is just about to arrive. The day of the Lord is very, very soon. He said, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Didn't we just read that a moment ago in Matthew? Jesus said it in Matthew, hundreds of years later. And you know what? The first time you read that description is in the second chapter of Joel, the 31st verse, and it says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Is it going to be terrible? Oh, is it ever going to be terrible when Jesus comes back? Listen, if you're on the wrong side, you are on the wrong side. You're going to find out how terrible the wrath of God really is. He will come back. And all that's going to be seen in the heavens. Look in that third chapter, the 16th verse says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion. Zion. 
That's, that's the mount where everything, Israel, uh, Jerusalem is, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Oh my, can you get that? I got to look up here. The Lord's going to roar out of Zion. Well, where is Jesus now? Is he in Jerusalem? No, he's in heaven right now. He's got to come back to roar out of Jerusalem. He's coming. And when he roars, the whole earth is going to shake. Now, I, I can just imagine that's about the only word Prophet Joel could come up with that was going to halfway describe what it's going to be like when Jesus makes his move. He is going to roar out of Jerusalem. He's going to establish where he is. He's going to establish where his throne is and where the temple has been. He is going to roar out of Jerusalem. Oh, my. Amen. He has left heaven and come to earth. You, you read over in the 19th chapter of Revelation, it talks about Jesus getting on a white horse. And when you read in Zechariah, which we will in just a moment how he comes to earth, he's going to come back exactly as they said in the second chapter of Acts, when he ascended to heaven, the same Jesus that you've seen going to heaven is coming back again in like manner. He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives from which he left. So we know where he's going to come back to. Where's the Mount of Olives? It's just east of the city of Jerusalem. There's a Kidron Valley in between. So Jesus is coming back to the Mount of Olives. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley, and there's the eastern gate of the city. Some of y'all been there. You've seen that eastern gate. You know what it's like. It's sealed up, isn't it? Did he still have armed guards over it? Barbed wire? Bar yeah. You know why? They don't want the Messiah coming through the gate. This is, this is true. This has been under Muslim control for centuries, and they don't want the Messiah coming through the gate. They, they've read the prophecy. That's what he's going to do. They said, oh, no, we're not going to let him come through the gate. We'll seal it up. So they did. I mean, they sealed it up just to make sure they got guards up there, got barbed wire up there. I stopped that Messiah. They don't know who he is. <laughs> Can I tell you, this is the foolishness that's going on and been going on for centuries over there. But the day comes when he comes back to the Mount of Olives. He's coming down, and he's going to cross. And he's going to go through that gate, and he's going to go to the top of the temple mount, which is right on the other side of that gate. And there's where he is going to roar. He's going to rule, and he's going to reign, and he's going to roar, and the world's going to hear something like they've never heard before. Well, we've got to get into this a little bit more. I've got to go, but my imagination is running with me. I've got to get back to the scriptures of what he says. Listen, folks, at this point, Jesus will have returned. He will have returned when he roars. Now go to Zechariah. Zechariah says some things so plain that we don't want to miss it. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. So you see another reference to the same event. And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. That's what the Antichrist army is going to do to the people that are in the city of Jerusalem. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And in the third verse it says, Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Oh, we're now, now we finally got to the Battle of Armageddon. Now we've got the Psalm 83 war behind us. We got the Gog Magog war behind us. Now, no, this is the final war between Jesus and the Antichrist armies. He says, I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem in the 12th chapter of Zechariah. Back up just to the 12th chapter and look at verse 9. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Amen. Oh, listen. You know what it's going to look like. You, you, you just read it. Jesus, when I come, says, when I come back, I'm going to come back to destroy all those nations that are coming against Jerusalem. 
because they're the only holdout against the Antichrist, and I'm going to pour out on the house of David the heaven's spirit of grace. That means they don't deserve the good thing I'm going to do for them. They're not all Christians. They're, they, no, they're just not going to worship Satan, He's, but it's grace. You know, when you got saved, was it by grace or by your good works? Grace. God's grace. Same thing here. He said, I'm going to do this for them. It's by my grace that I'm going to do this. And supplication means they've been praying, man. They're scared to death. They see all the armies of the world coming against them. They've been praying, praying, oh, God, help us. He said, I'm going to answer their prayers. He said, then they're going to look on me whom they've pierced. Oh, we just went from the future of Jerusalem to the cross. Back to the cross which was right outside the city of Jerusalem. He's coming back to the place where they killed him. They pierced. And they're going to look on me, the one that they pierced. And they said, well, I mean, how can they pierce him? They, they weren't even born yet. Their ancestors pierced him. They knew it. And they're going to look on me whom they have pierced, and they're going to mourn. And they're going to be in bitterness. Why? Why are they going to be mourning and in bitterness? They're going to recognize Jesus for who He is. They're going to see the nail scars in His hands. He's still got them. When they see Him, they're oh my, He is the Messiah. He is Jesus of Nazareth. He is God's Son. Our ancestors killed Him and we have rejected Him. And they're mourning, grieving. Oh, Jesus, forgive us. They're weeping. They pierced Him. It's for his sins we died. For our sins he died. They're going to recognize that more plainly than you and I do. It was for our sins that he died. And if he were to walk through the door right now with the nail-pierced hands and you'd look at him and say, Oh, Jesus, I'm so sorry for what you went through for me. That's what they're going to do. They're going to be mourning and grieving and they're going to be bitter at themselves. They've rejected him. You see, they are really going to see him they're going to see him in his glorified body. And the whole world is going to see him too when he comes back. Go back to the 14th chapter now. You were the 12th chapter. Verse 4. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Oh my. If you know the geography, and those of you who have been there know exactly what it says, that the Mount of Olives is just to the east of the city of Jerusalem. It's always been east of the city of Jerusalem ever since there was a Jerusalem. It still is. He ascended to heaven from there. He's coming back to there. And when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, it's going to split half in two. It's going to be a great valley created right across it from the Temple Mount across the Kidron Valley right on through the Mount of Olives. Half of the mountain is going to move to the north and half of it is going to move to the south. There's going to be a valley created there when he comes back. That's what this says. You think the world's not going to notice? He's going back and he's going to roar. Verse 5 says, And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Aziel. Ye shall flee like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Listen, there's an earthquake shaking the land. And Jesus is coming back. They're seeing something they've never seen before. And it says, And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Come on, saints. What are we doing? We're coming back. Somebody, oh, we get to get in on the battle. No, we're just going to be spectators. No, no, he doesn't need our help. Listen to me. He created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> he spoke it into existence. He doesn't need our help. He's going to come back and settle this thing once and for all. I said, all the saints are going to come with him. Look at the ninth verse. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. And there shall be one Lord and his name one. Amen. Just one. No doubt about it. He will rule the world with a rod of iron. There'll be no question about who is in control and who is charged. Where will you be when he comes back? Where will you be? 
Are you going to be one of those that comes back with him? I, I hope so. I hope that you're one of those that gets raptured up and come back with him and watch all this happen. Listen to him roar. Are you going to be one of those maybe it's still here? Because see, this can happen within your lifetime. You might still be here in mourning when you see him coming, perhaps. Or maybe you'll be martyred, I don't know. I hope you're not in that valley of decision, in Jeho valley of Jehoshaphat, where he, he does some terrible, terrible bloodletting. The Bible says that the blood in that battle is going to run bridle deep on a horse for 300 miles. You say, what? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. And you know what? I'm one of these crazy people. If the Bible says that, I believe it. How, how high is bridle, a horse's bridle? I don't know about that high. I guess it depends on how tall the horse is. And you know there is a valley? There is a valley from Mount Megiddo in the northern part of the country. And it, guess where it runs? All the way down to Jerusalem. It's going to be filled with millions of soldiers. But when Jesus comes back and Jesus roars, guess what's going to happen to those soldiers? They're going to die. Where are you going to be? You say, well, I don't know. You, you sound like you think that's going to happen pretty soon. Yeah, I do. I really do. I don't know how soon, but I think it's pretty soon. What's happening in Israel right now, I believe, is just a prelude to all of this. I mean, we may know in the next 48, 72 hours a week how far into this we're going to be. But it's coming. Whether this is the beginning of the Psalm 83 war or not, it's almost immaterial. It's, it's a war, and God said it was going to be happening. He's right now preparing His people for the return of His Son. Can you doubt that? Do you think Israel start, started to look around saying, we wonder if we're right with God or not? The only way to be right with God is to have His Son as your Lord and Savior. Are they right with God now? Some are, not all. He's preparing His people for the return of His Son. He's preparing the land He's preparing His people. So the big question is, are you prepared? Are you prepared? If you're not, you're the whole reason we're giving an invitation right now. To let anybody who is not certain they're prepared for the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, and all this other stuff we've talked about, if you're not sure you're right with God, we're giving an invitation. We are inviting you to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So that when all this happens, you don't have a thing to worry about. That's right. You'll be His. Let's pray. Father, You're allowing us to live through some very exciting times, fearful times, some of us tragic times. But Father, we know that if that means the rapture of the church takes place this afternoon and we're gone, it'll be a joyful time, but it'll be sad for those that are left behind. Father, I pray for those that might have listened to this today and said, I don't know which side I would be on. I, I don't know if I'd be one of those that are in heaven and coming back with Jesus for that final battle. I, I don't know. Or maybe they're thinking, I know, but it's not good. Father, for anybody that's here right now that's not certain they're saved, just give them the faith it takes to say, Dear God, forgive me. Forgive my sins. Not because I'm going to try to do better, but because of Jesus. God, forgive me for Jesus' sake. I know He took my place on a cross, paid the price in full so you can forgive me. Please forgive me. And may they pray, dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Be my Savior. May they pray, dear Jesus, I give myself to you to be Lord king over my life from now on. Father, I know you hear every prayer like that's prayed like that if it's meant this morning. And Father, I do pray for those who are praying to trust Jesus right now, wanting to be saved. Father, I pray that you'll give them the faith to come forward and let it be known. I am not ashamed of asking Jesus to save me. I'm coming to let it be known today. Help them, Father, please. In Jesus' name, amen.